Welcome to Mintel's Little Conversation podcast. Welcome to Mintel's Little Conversation, where our experts bring you fresh ideas and new perspectives on how consumers eat, drink, shop, groom, and think. I'm Andrew Davidson, SVP and Chief Insights Officer for Mintel Compare Media, based in New York. And today's on today's podcast, we are talking about the future of money. Now, this is very timely because I've li literally just in Las Vegas for the Money 2020 conference, which I was attending with my colleague and fellow guest on the pod today, Dr. Mark Miller, based in Chicago. Um, also joining us to discuss the future of money, I am delighted to welcome Des Deborah Osgethorpe in London. And also to welcome back to the pod, Dr. Bahis Ilhan, who's joining us from uh, today from Portland, Oregon. So welcome to the pod. Hi. Hi, Hi Andrew. Thank you. Hi, Andrew. Hi, everyone. All right. So if you could just, uh, for our listeners, if you could just say a quick uh, word of introduction, give some, perhaps your title and w what you do and how long have you been at Mintel? So I'll start. Uh, Mark Miller. I'm the Associate Director of Insights for Payments at Mintel and been here a little over a year, maybe around 14, 15 months now. Um, time kind of flies. Um, so in my role, that really means I perform When you're having fun. <laughs> lots of fun, lots of fun with Andrew the last few days at uh, Money 2020. So, uh, but uh, that role means really that I perform research, produce content that I share with our top clients in financial services, mostly covering key developments and trends in credit cards, lending, and, and the overall kind of broader financial landscape. Hi, I'm Debbie Osgathorpe, and I head up the uh, UK financial services research on the report side of things for Mintel. Um, I've been at Mintel for getting on for 13 years. <laughs> Um, and my, um, the reports that we cover um, in the UK, kind of, we do 42 different reports across financial services co covering a real wide breadth of uh, different consumer markets. Hi, my name is uh, Behis Ilhan. Uh, I am a senior trend strategist at Mintel. I provide futuristic opinions and perspectives on trends and how they impact the brand landscape. I work client facing, uh, helping our clients as a strategic partner uh, to future cast their uh, strategies. Fantastic. Two, two doctors on the pod today. So <laughs> if the electricity goes out while you're listening to this, then don't panic. <laughs> Listen. Serious insights going on on this podcast. Um, so I'm excited to talk about the future of money. I do want to start with a, a, a somewhat funny story because, I mean, we we're just back from Money 2020. And actually, a few years ago, I was there and I, pres I was presenting on the, and the topic was how Generation Z will shape the future of payments. And I then asked, I asked my then 12-year-old son how we would pay in the future. And he actually said, he came up with something interesting. He said, telepathy. Um, which I thought it was pretty interesting. And then I asked my nine-year-old at the time, and she said, some sort of chip in your hand, think about a purchase, and then it will appear already paid for. Um, I so, should talk to your kids more often. Like, <laughs> yeah, this is not just about bragging about my super smart children. But yeah, I dug it. I think, I think we probably should have invited your daughter onto the <laughs> podcast today because there are chips that you can insert into your hand to, uh, to make payments. And yes. it's happening technology out of Sweden. And it's, uh, it's even come to the US. There's a company up in Wisconsin that uses that to pay for goods in the cafeteria. Also access restricted area just by waving your hand. It's, uh, yes. It's, yeah. It's so, I, I, we, I know that's interesting. And I, I mean, I, I remember back at the time, I sort of dug into it a little further and I found that, this, that Ericsson Consumer Labs was actually predicting something called mind sharing to be mainstream by 2020. So, um, you know, it, oh, clearly that didn't months. happen. It didn't happen. But Elon Musk is apparently taking on neurotechnology uh, into, uh, into uh, making that a major project of his. So, you know, you never know. Um, anyway, ha Mark, we were back, just back from Vegas. Mark, tell us a little bit about Money 2020 before we uh, get started. So yeah, a, a very action-packed few days. Uh, it's always always a, a pleasure to to be able to attend a conference like that. But um, you know, big themes coming out of it this year. A lot of continued themes from previous years. Uh, you know, one, a lot of talk around financial inclusion. Uh, really focusing on how artificial intelligence and machine learning can uh, can help to uh, expand credit opportunities to the underserved. Um, also, a little bit of a shift of the conversation. So, I think last year we heard a lot about blockchain and cryptocurrency just in general. Um, this year, kind of really honed in on on stable coins as the next big financial mm. instrument. So, uh, so a lot of emphasis on on things like you know the Libra, yes. uh, Facebook Libra, and other stable. They had coins. David Marcus from from Libra was there. 
success. Exactly, a big so keynote. That was interesting. And just for, for those of you who are not on the listeners who are not familiar with Money Twenty Twenty, it's actually the, uh, a very large. Pay- it's been going eight, for eight years. It's basically a payments, fintech, and financial services conference. All right, so let's get into the future of money. Um, and obviously, you know, you can't really think about well, that classic statement. You can't look. At, you can't predict the future without understanding the past. So I've asked our resident uh, doctor of history to give us the history of money in 90 seconds. Can you do that? All right, Andrew. So essentially All tens right. of thousands of years of history in 90 seconds. I'm I'll, timing I'll, you. I'll do my best here. So, uh, you know, of course, people have been trading goods and services since, you know, before recorded time, but we'll skip to the idea of creating an actual currency. So coins made of metal, clay, later paper came to represent the value associated with actual goods. Uh, you know, naturally coins were a lot easier than, than things like livestock and grains to kind of drag into a market to trade. So as long as you each society trusted that intrinsic value associated with the currency. It was a pretty simplified way of conducting commerce. So now let's fast forward again to the growth of kind of interstate and global trade. Uh, local currencies that might have been trusted within those small communities weren't always exchangeable hundreds or thousands of miles away. So we began to see the growth of uh, standardized currencies. And then much, much later again, you know, let's, let's fast forward again to the 19th century. You know, modern technology like the telegraph enabled the first electronic funds transferred. Uh, from this emerge money orders, travelers checks, credit, then debit cards. You know, more recently, another technological revolution saw plastic get replaced by phones. Now with P2P transfers, contactless payments, mobile wallets, you know, it's sometimes hard to remember the last time you actually handled what we used to consider money just a couple decades ago. So uh, taking it even one more step further, those traditional currencies like the dollar, pound, euro are at risk of being replaced entirely by cryptocurrencies, which, which may or may not be linked to anything of real value. So, you know, in conclusion, money's changed a lot over time from goods to coins to paper to plastic to electronic exchange. But, you know, that's really just the absolute tip of the iceberg. Wow. Fantastic. So, so take a deep breath, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> that was Impressive. history of money in 90 seconds. Well, yeah, well done. Well done. 90 seconds, give or take. Yeah, I, you know, actually, I wasn't really timing. But um, all right. So it's a big topic. And, you know, there are many things that, you know, we can't probably cover all aspects of it in our sort of 20 to 30 minutes uh, podcast. But um, plenty of com- big components to break down. And so let's start with one that's debated, which is this whole idea of the cashless society. So, um, question will we ever have a cashless society and if so when oh a nice easy one just to start off with there (laughs) no controversy um yeah i mean if you look at the data um you would say yeah we are heading towards a cashless society um in the uk now we do make more payments on cards than we do uh via cash 2017 was a watershed year here we um, I think halfway through that year, we started paying more on debit cards than we did on, on cash payments. And that, you know, trajectory is just continuing. Um, so, yeah, you, you follow that through and, and we do see, you know, that follows through that, that you know, we'll see the end of cash at some point. But second part of that when is much mm-hmm. more for debate, I think. Um, you know, you do hear, you know, there's a lot of... Um, a lot of media stories around cashless society. It always provokes a very strong response. Um, there are predictions, mm-hmm. you know, in 10 years, we'll be almost there. But I think when you actually look at it, um, you know, my personal view is in 10 years, no, we will, cash will still be very much part of, of, of what we have. It just will be used less and less. Uh, because at the moment, cash is a, still a really important um, payment method for consumers. It, you know, it's, it's a secondary payment method. Debit cards. Do, you, do you think consumers want, want, a, want a cashless society? I think there are consumers who are, I kind of see that as the, I think it's, I think it's, it really is a, I think it splits consumers. I think for some people can absolutely accept that's the way it's going. You know, personally, I can, can't really remember the last time in the last few days when I've used cash at all. Um, in fact, particularly paying in a, you know, in, in, in a shop, um, I, you know, I can't remember using cash for a really, really long time. It's just not part of what I personally do now. Um, but, you know, a lot of people still really do rely on cash and, you know, wholly rely on cash still in this country. And it's a really, right. 
Uh, you know, in the UK, you know, there is a big regulatory focus on making sure people aren't left behind. And I think those kind of things will mean that, you know, despite the, the growth towards cashless society, I think governments will take an active interest in trying to make sure that, you know, we're taking people with us and people aren't left behind. Yeah. And Well, certainly the government's starting to step in here or there's debate about regulation here in the US about making sure that, um, that, that, that consumers can still pay with cash because, of course, it does, um, buy, you know, it's, it's inherently biased towards those um, of lower Older income. Older consumer groups, lower income um, groups, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and there is this, this, this feeling, I think, at the moment around protecting, you know, people who, you know, could be more, vun you know, financially vulnerable. So, um, you know, yeah, I would say... 10 years time I would still expect cash to be part of the payment landscape but it's just playing less sure. of a role and the cash infrastructure that we all kind of appreciate is also under a lot of pressure so it's going to be kind of interesting to see what happens with regards to that as well. We, what about so, so obviously we've seen this to very like UK is obviously very different to the US and we've got you know different sort of situations in terms of this around the world you know uh, you know what other what are the countries that are sort of moving more quickly towards cashless? What are the, you know, so what lessons can we learn from them or are there other, are there lessons? Yeah. So there's really two, two paths here. Um, and a lot of the more kind of established economies like in Canada, the UK, uh, Europe, Australia, you know, we've seen contactless credit and debit cards emerge really as a, as a preferred kind of de facto method of purchase uh, uh, for everyday items. Um, a lot of this, stemmed, you know, a lot of this growth stemmed from the use of pu on public transportation in densely populated areas. And, and I mentioned specifically contactless cards here, not just credit and debit, because I think the advent of that technology really started to encourage people to use cards for, you know, very small purchases. So, you know, $10, you know, five pounds, wherever you are, you know, just tap the card and go as a, as a uh, instead of using cash. So interestingly, the, the U.S. Is, has kind of lagged behind. Um, but we're starting to pick up the pace. So we actually had the capability for contactless cards like 10 years ago, but it was based on uh, on older technology that, that was less secure. Um, so when other countries switched to chip and pin cards, uh, they started to adopt contactless. In the U.S., we were late to chip cards and then late to, to contactless. So we've kind of skipped a step and start to use mobile wallets. Um, and the rest of the world is now kind of catching up there. So the other path is really what we're seeing in East and kind of Southeast Asia. Um, and this is really those technology giants joining the financial services payment space like Alipay, WeChat Pay, Grab Pay. So, you know, linked to those existing social or e-commerce accounts um, and using QR codes to interact. So, uh, this type of innovation was a lot easier to scale in places like China and Southeast Asia because they, they lacked the complex legacy networks, uh, issuers, payment processors, all of those different players that dominate uh, systems like in the U.S. So uh, hard to kind of displace that. But when you're starting from a, a less mature system, you can implement those, those newer technological systems. I think it's also worth looking um, at Sweden, mm. who I think are kind of widely accepted to be, you know, probably about the furthest down the road of any of the countries in terms of becoming cashless. There are kind of, um, I think, estimates that they're going to become cashless within the next two or three years. Um, so it's quite interesting to see kind of what's happened there. I know that, you know, British government have been speaking to, you know, Swedish counterparts when they're looking at kind of what's, what's happened there and the challenges that they've actually sort of faced. Um, mm. Because right. like, so I was reading about Sweden, it wasn't necessarily that consumers wanted to go in that direction. It was more that it was kind of almost forced upon them. Uh, by necessity. Sweden is a lab for trying many ideas. It's a lab? Yes, for many uh, consumer ideas, especially in financial services. That's how I see it. And I take anything happening in Sweden very seriously about um, new technology. I mean, they've really taken up that kind of mobile peer-to-peer -peer payments there, which, you know, although we've got services in the UK that have launched over the last few years, they've just not really gained any traction. But I think they've got Swish there, which has become... Uh, you know, really kind of, you know, integral part and it's, you know, really help people to kind of, you know, to sort of bridge that gap. Mm. Um, but we just haven't really kind of taken, say, the same stuff on board here. Mm. So do, do I, any of you feel that we will go totally cashless or is it, or are we all on the, in, of the mindset that there'll always be a, a piece of, a piece of... This is a transition. I see it as that. Um, so this is a transition. How many of us are writing checks? But probably our grandparents did. So mm. um, 
this is a transition for our generation to go cashless. Generation later, two generations later, uh, they will born into that. So that's what they will know. But I want to build on what uh, Marka said uh, about um, the South Asia. In South Asia, we see a lot of leapfrogging, meaning uh, the adoption of technology is not linear. They do most of the people there don't have home lines for phones, but they directly go from not having a phone to a, a mobile yes. phone. In Africa, we see a lot of leapfrogging in terms of uh, adoption of technology as well. Uh, so I think uh, in the adoption of these new financial services uh, using QR codes um, and all, uh, we will see a lot of leapfrogging because 1.7 billion people are unbanked globally and two thirds of them have a mobile phone or a mobile system. So uh, the, that leapfrogging makes sense uh, in these uh, unbanked uh, segment. Hmm. It's worth pointing out too when we talk about unbanked, and of course that's a that's an astronomical figure, but it gets even higher and higher when we think about the underbanked or the underserved, or people who might have some access to some sort of financial services, but are really blocked out from the from the whole suite that that many of us take for granted. So you have a huge opportunity there, both with the unbanked and those that uh, that are underbanked. Hmm. Do you, so do you think, so if we're, we're all kind of saying that there's, we're in a transitionary phase, what, does it change like who the players are? How does the ecosystem change uh, in terms of who we're thinking is in the mix when it comes to, to payments and money in terms of brands, companies? Everybody makes the assessment or makes the observation that um, big tech giants are uh, coming in uh, into the financial services. I ask why. Why does Apple have a credit card? Why mm -hmm. does Amazon care to, uh, for the unbank? Um, why did Amazon took, uh, take Whole Foods out of Instacart? There is a war among these big tech giants about creating an ecosystem and dominating the path to purchase funnel from top to bottom, from awareness mm -hmm. to choice and after choice, the logistics, the delivery. Right. So that's right. You keep, you keep someone within that ecosystem and then they're going to shop with you. Yes. I mean, essentially it's a, it's a, it's a global business story. It's a profitability play. You can, uh, you know, you gain more customers, you gain more transactions, you earn more revenue from it. I mean, in the case of something like the Apple card, obviously improving the revenue from services, gaining merchant fees from, uh, from people using Apple pay more or from transacting with the Apple credit card card now. Um, you see that, you know, there's a big opportunity. There's kind of a bit of a gap that's been left uh, from, from some of the more traditional players in financial services not innovating quite enough. And anytime you have a gap like that uh, in, a, in a robust economic environment, you know, someone's going to jump in there and fill it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not that. And on top of that, you need the financial services to be able to dominate the funnel from awareness to the choice. That is the stitch that takes the consumer from awareness to, to the purchase. That's why these companies, tech giants, who are trying to build big ecosystems uh, over from taking the consumer from the search to the choice and delivering it needs a financial solution. I always say uh, whoever has a financial solution is in the ecosystem game in terms of the tech services. So uh, financial services are the backbone of these ecosystems. Um, and uh, why didn't other more conventional uh, services or financial services uh, cannot build these ecosystems? Because their digital footprint at the top of the funnel is not enough. They haven't thought about that early on. So you, you don't search from a Bank of America, you don't search for a product in a Bank of America search engine. You either search on Amazon, you either search on uh, Google, um, that's where the tech companies get you. Mm. There is a reason why uh, uh, Ale uh, Amazon is trying to sell you a $19 Alexa, because they want to get you early on and they want to convert that to a purchase. And you need a financial solution to do that. Do you, so do you, are you, we saying then, do you think that the banks are becoming more in this ecosystem, which is, a, you know, it's, a, it's the word, the word of the, the week, I think we came up at Money 2020 as well. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the banks are taking more then of a bank, they'll be more behind the scenes and less of the storefront. Uh, they thought they were instrumental to a purchase, right? 
tra transaction, the third party that comes and completes the transaction. Mm. Big tech giants taking a role and offering financial services is basically saying that banks, we don't need the instrumental role of banks, we can complete the transaction without them. Mm -hmm. Everybody, not only financial services, has to re redefine their businesses in this ecosystem approach. Mm -hmm. um, Hulu is not only a streaming service, they're an entertainment business. Bank of America is not in financial services, they're in the uh, transaction marketplace. So it's just everybody has to redefine their business um, in this mm. ecosystem approach, unless it's the you, banks... Where you, those examples, are, you just reminded me of one from Money 2020 when somebody, I, I think it was Varro Bank, said, we, we want to think of ourselves like Netflix, Yes, um, which is uh, in terms of their data. I think it's quite interesting, though, to think of this from the consumer perspective as well, though, in that you know, our research would show that consumers at the moment are still really wary about the role that these tech giants could play in financial services. And despite not necessarily always really loving traditional banks or insurance companies and things, still really hold a stall by the fact that these are the companies that they feel mm. most trusted, they feel most yeah. comfortable with, most confident with, they trust their data with, specifically their financial data. So whilst I completely appreciate, you know, all the developments that are happening and the ecosystems that have been created, I think it's sort of, you know, I think it's quite mindful to still think about where consumers are on that journey themselves. Um, Absolutely. And, and you, know, you said it there, really, trust. Trust is the word, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, Comes out, you know, all the and time. Who are you gonna, and it's and fundamental. Really, yeah. and so it's, 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 it's absolutely inherent on banks to, to kind of treat that like gold, you know, because... And, and can maintain that because if that erodes, then they are in trouble. Yeah. Build, building on that consumer um, decision-making, these ecosystems will change consumer decision-making. Awareness will not matter much, right? If Alexa is ordering you a toothpaste every three months, you knowing a brand or not will not matter much. Or if Alexa cannot find your brand, if it's okay to order uh, anyways. So... That's the consumer decision making is really changing where you don't take your card out, where you don't uh, really say or choose uh, or go to the store to buy it. Uh, then uh, th the role of the financial systems are changing. And uh, the brands, some brands, especially um, MasterCard, Visa, uh, are aware of these contactless systems to increase awareness and at least to be on top of mind for the consumers. Uh, MasterCard has created and filed a patent for Sonic logo eight months ago. So that it's just like a short jingle. If we don't take our cards, if we don't see the logo, they still want oh, to be. Oh, yeah, I've seen that. Yeah. yeah. They still want to be uh, somewhere in the minds of the consumer. So, so let's change, change uh, well, not topics completely, but just like change the direction a little bit. One of the things, you know, over the last couple of years, a lot of, you know, we've heard this phrase, invisible payments or frictionless payments. Um, I wanted, you know, that's something that's perhaps a bit more written now as opposed to in the future. We, where, what, what innovations have you each seen? We're indications of where we're going with regards to invisible payments. Anything that would stand out? Well, we've kind of covered a couple of those ideas just in the last uh, in the last uh, conversation we had. But uh, mm. you know, of course, you know, places like Amazon Go, the 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 shop, the grocery store where you walk in, and yeah, maybe you have to scan a barcode when you enter the store. Store, but then you know, you just pick things off the shelves, put in your basket, walk out. There's never really a transaction, and and that's kind of top of mind. But even if you look back to to ride sharing, like Uber and Lyft, it's it's kind of a similar idea where you're you know you're signing up for a service or you're requesting a service, but then all the transactions just happening in the background, so it's kind of invisible to the consumer consumer. Mm. Um, and those are the sort of things that you could even look further back as just entering your credit card details into your Amazon account and having a one click shop, right? It's that idea of not really having that interaction with a merchant to, to make a financial exchange. So we see a lot of that stuff happening. I do think, again, bringing it back to the consumer perspective, you know, this idea of frictionless payments, you know, we need to, uh, I think consumers still often want a little bit of friction. Um, and consumers want some sort of touch point. So maybe it's enough to scan an app when you walk into a store and not just have it go completely without some sort of interaction. But this idea that, okay, I am, I'm taking some step 
to confirm that I that I approve of this transaction mm-hmm. is something that we need to maintain a little bit of. I, um, Amazon Go, I, they're up to thirteen stores now. I I hear so clearly it's yeah. on, the, on the rise. But they don't have one in the UK yet. No, um, we've had a, I'm Sainsbury's and the big grocery firms here um, kind of trialed a, a sort of similar kind of checkout free store actually quite close to the office here. Um, but actually brought back checkouts after a few months because um, customers just weren't really, um, you know, buying, I, mean, it's, it's, like... I know, I know. <laughs> um, it's very close to the Sainsbury's head office and I suspect a lot of the customers were probably Sainsbury's uh, members of staff. But um, yeah, no, apparently there were too many people queuing to speak to the person at the yeah. back of the store that was, uh, you know, doing things yeah. that. You know, stuff's coming. They're just trialing stuff at the moment. And I think that's all kind of to be expected. It's going to be a whole, you know, it's a huge shift, isn't it, to do that, to sort of, you know, the mentality to walk into a store and feel that, you know, it's kind of, you can do that and the technology is there to support that and you're not going to get kind of stopped on the way out. It's, it's yes. you know, because just new behavior that people have kinds of. And when we talk about cashless too, from, from, from what we were saying before, those Amazon stores now in the US have started to accept cash. Um, partially because of fear of, of alienating certain customers, but you can actually pay cash in those stores now, which is an interesting development because the original idea was completely a, a cashless kind of, you know, transaction free almost experience. Uh, look, let's change topics quickly to cryptocurrency. I don't want to stay on this too long, but you know, Mark mentioned it. Uh, Behis, I know you wrote a, a really great article on Libra a few weeks ago. So I just wanted to just, I don't want to get into cryptocurrency too deeply, but I just wanted to throw out a question. Is it a fad or is it here to stay? Let's ask Behis, I'll ask you first because you wrote that article. Uh, David Marcus was at uh, Money 2020. Uh, what are you thinking now after all of these regulatory and political discussions around Libra? Yes. Um, so it was a more uh, introductory article on Libra just to bring our clients and our readers up to speed and simplify it. Uh, and I'm sorry that things are not going well for Libra, but it doesn't matter. Libra, Kibra, Tibra, something will stick. Uh, the, the idea, I don't think cryptocurrency is a fad. Uh, cryptocurrency mm-hmm. is not a fad because, uh, you know, I always bring this up. One of our important uh, trends that we talk for 2020 and in 19 is coexistence. Digital civilization will be a mesh of human and non-human agents coexisting and interacting and helping each other to do what they do best. So we will be living with uh, robots, bots, AIs, drones, smart non-human agents. For us to get ready for that um, coexistence dynamics, we need uh, a form of digital currency. I will give you an example. Uh, Jaguar Smart Wallet um, is basically a new system. Uh, The car can earn cryptocurrency. The dashboard on the car can earn cryptocurrency. Which smart wallet did you say? Jaguar. Oh, Jaguar. Yes. Jaguar smart wallet it can earn cryptocurrency when it communicates the potholes and the traffic potholes on the road and the traffic jam to the server. Now to the server in the future to the other smart cars. And it can use that cryptocurrency, it can save that cryptocurrency and it can spend it on tolls, charging an electric car or maybe buy, co- uh, buy coffee for its driver. Um, in the future. What does this mean? This is very important. We have new economic agents in this coexistence. Who is an economic agent? Economic agent is a someone or a something that can earn money, save money and spend money. I'm not saying the driver is earning money. The car is earning money. That means in the future, your self-driving car Mm -hmm. will be going out, work, do Uber all day, earn money, and then save it and spend it or maybe translate it to you. I don't know what the dynamics will be with the owner and stuff. But for this coexistence, we need uh, a form of cryptocurrency. We will see new economic agents, robots, uh, self-driving cars uh, that will coexist with each other and transform into new economic agents. Wow. Mm. 
new economic agents. I like it. All right. So we're going, so in the interest of time, because we are running out of time, I'm going to say, I'll ask each of you just to say, you know, any, any lessons for either brands or consumers, just sort of one kind of final word um, on sort of how brands can think about this whole area of the future of money. What, what should they be doing in, in any kind of area that you'd like, to, direction you'd like to take it? Mark, do you want to stop? Sure. So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll stick to the topic of credit cards since it's one of the, the key areas of focus that I have. So, um, you know, I think it's, it's important for, for credit card issuers in particular out there to, to focus more on this entire ecosystem. And we referenced this earlier in the conversation, um, not just think about, uh, you know, competitive challenges around rewards, rates, and bonuses. So, you know, you have credit cards today that have, you know, certain categories have really become a commodity. Like every issuer has a 1.5% card uh, in the US. Um, you know, we've seen very recently the, these other brands not traditionally associated much with finance credit and credit cards enter the space. So, of course, Apple, uh, we also have Walmart, we have Uber now that are creating these full payment ecosystems, you know, embracing mobile technology and, and providing really an end to end and very transparent user experience. And I think in the future for this industry, that's really where we need to go, leveraging that technology, leveraging what consumers want and offering them a product from end to end that can really meet all those needs. Um, I think I'm going to go back to sort of consumers again, really, and say that, you know, I, we've seen in the UK, we've got some new banks that have come in, you know, in recent years and have been really kind of successful in terms of gaining customers. We've got the likes of Monzo and Starling, you know, Monzo are heading up to 3 million customers here in the UK, and they've come from sort of nowhere in a really short amount of time. So, you know, consumers, certain groups of consumers are really ready to embrace new brands, new ways of thinking, new ways of managing finances. But I think that there's, you know, our research shows that there's still some really fundamental things that you have to have in place. Um, you know, first and foremost, security, as we sort of touched on security and trust, just, you know, utmost in people's minds when they're looking at new services. Reliability, mm -hmm. you know, it's got, people have got to feel it's going to do what it, it should do when they want it to. Um, and, you know, fundamentally, if people are only going to take things on board if it's really going to make life easier for them. So really delivering that, that convenience and, you know, you know, making life you know, a bit easier is the, is the real driver, I think. Mm -hmm. The Heath, lessons for brands today, for now? Um, lessons for brands um, today, uh, think of it not only on the individual level, individual consumer level, think of it on the evolution of systems level. So um, do not just think of individual consumer, what they do, look at how the uh, systems are evolving, uh, what's happening, uh, how do experiences come together and build, uh, cr create systems. But I want to bring something else very important for 2020. We will be talking at Mintel. I, I'm talking more and more with clients as well. Decentralized networks. We will be talking about this decentralized networks and the use of decentralized networks for decentralized finance. Uh, so those are uh, hmm. topics. Let's give it hint and we will oh. follow up probably with another podcast or something similar. That sounds, uh, that sounds very interesting. <laughs> something we'll uh, look teaser, forward teaser. to hearing about. Uh, that was a, definitely a teaser yeah. campaign at the end of the podcast. Well done for getting that in. Um, so final question, this is going to be my quick fire round, which I will check back with you in like, you know, 30 years time. So fill in the blank. <laughs> um, I'm going to read out some payment vehicles, instruments, and ask you, do, will they exist in 2050? I just want a yes or no answer. No explanations. Uh, I know you you guys like to talk a lot. So <laughs> yes or no? All right. Was well, that a complaint? <laughs> no, this is a podcast. It's all about talking. Right, fi right. Quick fire round. What will these exist in 2050? Plastic credit cards. Mark. Yes. Debbie. No. Ooh, <laughs> peace. No, they're getting heavier Ooh. apparently. No plastic. No. Oh, good. No, yeah, I, 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 uh, good one. Uh, plastic debit cards. Mark. Yes. Yes. Be Debbie? No. Peace? No. You want metal ones, I know. All right, checks. Metal's too expensive. They go, they're going to have to keep your costs <laughs> down, checks. especially for those no fee <laughs> products. Uh, checks. Mark? Uh, no. Debbie? No. <laughs> Peace? No. Oh, okay. I better save my last checkbook. Um, cash. Mark? Yes. Debbie? No. Okay. Peace? Yes. Cryptocurrency? 
Mark? Yes, and I'm going to break the rules and say, though, that I expect it to be less consumer-facing than we might expect. Okay. Debbie? Uh, yes, the technology behind it, but not as we currently would look at cryptocurrency. Peace. Yes, centralized and decentralized versions together. So you guys are breaking the rules. Every, now. Everyone but, broke the rules but, on that but, one. Yeah. 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 Yes or no? <laughs> Bank branches. Yes. Debbie? Yes. Peace. Yes. And finally, the most exciting one, wire transfers. And the toughest one, Andrew. So I'm going to say yes, but they're probably on their last legs, similar to how we look at checks today. Debbie? Yes. <laughs> I like that. Very, a very strong yeah. yes. Doesn't there. sound like you've done many. No. <laughs> I have. Uh, Bahis? No. All right, fantastic. Well, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you, Bahis. Uh, thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, make sure you subscribe, rate, and review this pod- podcast on iTunes or any other platform wherever you get your podcast from. Uh, we're still fairly new. This is still season one. So please spread the word. Uh, We will catch you next week for another episode of Little Conversation. If you want to know more about Mintel, who we are, what we do, head over to mintel.com. Follow us on social media. We're on LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And check out our blog for even more insights from our analysts. Thank you. Thank you.